Fan mail. <laughs> if you make something and put it on the internet, the internet's freaking huge. Someone's going to love it. They're going to email you and tell you about it. Fan mail is really exciting and fun, and it is a gateway drug to the evils of self-googling. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm willing to admit that I have a bit of a problem with this, but I'm not giving it up. Um, so, yeah, you want to find out what people are saying about your game, and sometimes yourself, and so you end up doing this a fair bit. Um, some people swear by Google Alerts, which is a system that will send you regular emails about things that have appeared on the web about specific topics. Um, I find it's less comprehensive and I need every hit I can get. So I just use Google itself, um, use the last 24 hours, uh, filtered by search results, and then ordered by date, and basically just main the ego hit. Um, where are we at? Ah, OK. So we're about two years into fishy, fishy development. So Polychromatic Funk Monkey, um, little three month project, done, finished. And it's not going so great, fishy, fishy. Uh, I realized by this point, as a lot of other people do, that casual gamers don't really like twitchy, arcadey gameplay that, that requires you to learn a new skill, uh, other than sort of available puzzle solving and things like that. So it's really not working out for this crowd. Um, meanwhile, <laughs> the people who do like the twitchy, fun games have a look at, at this game that I've made, and I see like that the cute characters and the slick presentation and things. Um, and they just go, well, that's obviously not for me. So by attempting to straddle these two markets, I've fallen into this chasm in between, and there's just nobody there. So that, that's, that's a little bit fun. Um, but I thought I'd keep going with it. I still had goals for the project, and so even though I thought I was never going to make any money out of it, I thought, I still want to finish this thing. It's looking kind of shiny and slick. I just want to have this piece that I've finished and get it out there. Um, you know, it's a good resume piece. If I'm trying to get on digital distribution channels and things like that, it would help to be able to just show that I can finish something piece of quality. So I kept working on it. Um, another thing that was really kicking me at this point was I was finally working in content. Now, I'd never really done a lot of content work before. I'd always been uh, uh, sort of doing gameplay code for the last like, 10 years or something. And Fishy Fishy needed 60 levels. Now, that's 60 unique, interesting ideas, and for unique, interesting ideas, 60 is a massive number. Um, the other thing that was really not working out is I was like, kind of trying to churn these things out and making really slow progress. There was, there was no sense of progression between the levels, there was no um, flow, there was no variety, like it was just kind of a chaotic mess. So, what turned out to be the problem was that I hadn't properly defined the problem. Okay, I was saying I need 60 unique interesting levels. What I actually needed was 60 interesting unique levels that had a sense of progression and gameplay variety and flow. So, I started off just by separating the levels into these sets of five. And each set of five would be like a, a location. It would express a single idea in a variety of different ways. Um, and it allowed the player, once they finished a set of five, to really feel like they've moved on to something else. Because you've got to remember, these, these levels a good player can get through in like three to five seconds. So, you know, having them just move somewhere completely different every couple of seconds just does not work. Um, so that, that, that gave me that sense of progression. Moving on from that, um, I still wanted to get the, the sense of variance and a, a good difficulty curve. So I just came up with a simple pattern of roughly how levels would work. So, you know, the first level in a set of five would have only static food type enemies that you can just eat and they wouldn't move around, and then the next level they'd move, and then the next level you'd have enemies that nobody would move, 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 be moving, things like that. This basic template just overlaid on all the levels, uh, gave me the variation I needed, uh, it set kind of a, a tempo and a rhythm, it gave me a nice sawtooth difficulty curve so that people could feel that there was tension and kind of a bit of relief. Um, and it also made content generation so much easier, because I only needed like 12 ideas now, and I already had more than that, so I'd just pick the good ones. And I could just kind of explore those ideas instead of having to come up with something completely so, solve that problem. <laughs> I'm going to let you interpret this slide however you like as I talk about the difference between projects that have obviously been shown a lot of love and projects that have not been shown a lot of love. <laughs> um, players can tell. If you really love what you're doing, you're going to do awesome stuff and players can feel that. that that's something I, I believe and I hope to be true because I believe it. Um, 
And this was something that was actually making some of my work difficult. So I was doing content, and there were a couple of things that I was just having difficulty really liking what I was making. Uh, one of them was the, the actual narrative for the game. There wasn't much narrative, it's a game about eating other fish. But I wanted to put in a little bit. I just didn't come up with anything that was interesting. Luckily, my partner had suggested to me, well, look, you've got this game where this little fish eats like billions of other little fish. Surely it should just burst and explode at the end. And I thought, yes, actually, that's a story I like, so screw it, I'm going to make that. Um, and so from that, I was able to extrapolate the rest of it and, and really kind of got into writing that. The other part of it that really wasn't working for me was I wanted a little, just a tiny chunk of text at the start of each level, introducing it, uh, telling you a little bit about what's going on, because the rest of the game is really just expressed through little fish swimming around, um, which doesn't tell you a lot. Um, so what I was having a problem with there was just developing a voice um, and, and a, a, a means of, of communicating that, that kind of stuck with the, the fun, poppy nature of the rest of the game that didn't just kind of sound childish and grating. Uh, eventually, I just happened to be reading a Dr. Seuss book one day and just thought, yeah, rhyming couplets, done. So every single level uh, introduction became a short rhyming couplet. That's something I really enjoy writing. Um, and I feel that by enjoying writing it, I was able to make something that kind of reads a little better. So again, I was able to show, uh, uh, turn something that was really hard into something I enjoyed doing, and hopefully through that, turned it into something people were doing seeing it like. So I finished Fishy Fishy. Um, early 2008, I released it to great applause for people at But no, I was really happy with it. Um, it was done, I, I really liked the end products, and um, I think one review actually mentioned that they, they thought it was sort of around the pop cap quality bar, which is exactly what I was going for at this point, so I was, I was quite happy with it. Moving on, um, 2K Australia were very kind and they sent me to the Game Developers Conference 2008, and this was freaking awesome. Um, one of the really big highlights for this for me was meeting a lot of independent game developers. Uh, so I've, I've been following the scene for a long time, and, and you read about people like the big superstars in the genre who make the most amazing things, and they get all this publicity and press, and you just think, wow, you know, these people are really cool. Um, I met them. <laughs> that was a little bit scary. Um, <laughs> you can see that that's uh, Ron Carmel that I'm talking with there from 2D Boy, and you can see Phil Fish kind of falling over in the background. Um, anyway, so this, this was a huge thing for me. Um, so I, I was meeting these people who were, you know, always kind of billed as being fantastic and creative and these most amazing people. And when I met them, I realized that yes, this, this actually was true. These people were awesome. They were still people. Um, and I was a people. <laughs> so, you know, before then, I'd always dreamt of just going full bore at it and trying to make the most amazing things. But I never really felt like it was something I could possibly accomplish. And just by meeting these people, um, it occurred to me that maybe it was possible. And fuck it, I was going to try. So I did. And basically, yeah, meet your heroes if you have any amount of, sort of confidence problems about your own abilities. And it'll just make it so much easier for you to just start believing in yourself and do some crazy shit. Uh, whenever I go to a conference, I get super psyched. And I come home with like a million ideas for things I want to do. Um, this time around, it's just like, I'm going to make the best game ever. I don't even know what it's going to be. It's going to be fucking amazing. And at the same time, Tixor started running a small three-week competition to make a game. And some ideas about the theme for the game kind of intermingled with some other things I've been thinking about with uh, gameplay variation. And I ended up creating this, a game called Rum Check Fail. Um, I won't describe it too much, but basically this was a really big success story for me. Like it was a free game, and I just kind of you know put it out there, and it picked up uh, reviews and publicity in places like Kotaku and Joystick, and, and for three weeks work, that, that's really great. Um, so this was this was things that really kind of started to get moving. But when things start get uh, <laughs> when things start to move, you attract a bit more attention. And I started receiving occasional emails about things like business proposals and things. And that's, that's exciting, right? People send me emails saying, hey, let's do a deal, and you're going to make some money, and it's going to be great. Um, sometimes the correct answer is no, fuck off. 
because sometimes these people are just trying to rip you off. Like there, there are people out there who 